spooning broth back and forth while I peeled the crust off a bologna sandwich. Just as I took a bite, Brian leaned forward over his bowl and whispered, did you see mom's face? Again, the eyes. Now even wider behind his black rimmed glasses, I stopped chewing. He glanced over his shoulder at the kitchen where my mother washed dishes. You can't see it now. He turned back to me as hushed as a spy. But when she came into my bedroom, her face, it was hanging from her chin. He slumped back in his seat, let his spoon drop into the bowl with a clank that made me swallow a glob of bread and deli meat all at once. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, he said. I don't know what we're going to do till dad gets home. I had just seen my mother's face when she set the sandwich in front of me. I knew, knew that her face was fine. But that knowledge fled under the assault of this image and the intensity of Brian's whispers. Ants were nothing compared to the molten mess he just stuck in my head. Nothing compared to pus and blood and a faceless mother. And even worse, the lash of Brian's wondering, what are we going to do? It cut deep. I always follow Brian's lead. What are we going to do? I love that passage. And I think it's a perfect, it's indicative of a perfect kind of example of the memoir aspect of this writing where you're we're with you as you're with him and your family and you're writing from the, your the narrator is gone, right? We're in the voice of you as a, as a young woman interacting with him. And that's the love story in my mind, just the kind of connections between siblings. You're such a fangirl as he moves into the boxing world. And but you, well, what I really like about this book is that when after he dies and you're coming to terms, the reckoning, you're also kind of, you don't step away and just put him on, on a tray to look at. You put yourself through what you put him through. You look at your own struggles with, with, with things as, a, as you grew up, your own struggles with your family. Of course, addiction, the way it bounces around a family, of course, hits everybody. And so you get into that. Um, so, so that's, some, for me, a, a perfect way of just a perfect passage for you to read to capture that, that connection you have. What was it like writing this book um, how long did it take to write? I had to ask, setting you up. Um, it's a beautiful book. Congratulations. I'm really impressed by it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about coming to its form, right? Because writing this kind of book, it looks and feels all perfect when you're done, but it's a mess at the beginning. And you, you do three or four drafts and you don't even know what it is. And then you figure it out. How did you kind of figure this book out? Was there a moment when you kind of like, oh, I got it. Again, three or four questions. <laughs> well, um, for those of you who don't know, I started working on these uh, passages about my brother when I took a class with Sebastian in creative nonfiction. And um, I had never written creative nonfiction. I had just started to read some books that got me very excited about this form. And I thought I was gonna write something completely different. But what came up was writing about the boxing and my fangirl phase and so on. And so um, then, you know, pretty quickly I decided to do these <clears throat> interviews, excuse me, not just with the boxing folks, but also with friends of my brothers. And, and then, I think when I went into an MFA program, I had these kind of three things that were going on. I was writing these pieces about my brother and about our relationship. I was I had these interviews with folks. I was writing some of what I would call more essay, like more musing sort of reflective pieces. And so I decided to do a master of fine arts and 
creative nonfiction because I wanted some time to just really focus on this. And, um, and that's where the shape started um, to come together, this kind of braiding. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's very braided with interviews and with some of those reflections that happen sometimes because of conversations I've had with people. Um, and yeah, so I worked on that, worked on that, worked on that. So I then did this thing that some of you are aware of in this audience where I um, decided to co-found a nonprofit <laughs> and um, it took a lot of work. <laughs> Really? And yeah, and so I stepped away. It was all about writing and arts and all the good stuff, but I stepped away from working on this for about 10 years. Yeah. And then what, after I transitioned out of there and then it was the pandemic and then as we're coming through the pandemic, um, I decided that it was time to go back to it. And at that point, I even though I knew the form, I, it was there was still so much material. You and yeah, it's a complicated. What you're trying to do is very complicated. Yeah. So I worked with a um, developmental editor on that and um, cut a lot. You writers know what that's like. <laughs> um, all the little darlings. And uh, so honestly. I started in that class in 2003, and so it's 2023. Oh. <laughs> so you can do the math, right? <laughs> 20 years. And yeah, about half of that time, I was not actually working on it, but um, it was still kind of yeah. floating. Wow. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure it's an uncommon story. You know, life intervenes. I want you to read from this piece about Longo, but I'm just curious because I'm very impressed by your reporting, you know, going in and talking to these guys and men and women. But what was it like? Did you ever have any experiences where when you went back to interview some of these men, they were like, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? Or was it was there any places where it became kind of either uncomfortable or transcendent? Could have been a really beautiful thing. But I mean, but you, you must have gone into that thinking, wow, this is going to be interesting. I'm opening up a can of worms here, mm -hmm. right? Because so much of the story around Floyd Patterson and that world is that there was some stuff that went down that your family felt like was maybe a betrayal. There was a lot of stuff going on. So, and they obviously, as a group of men working with him and trying to move up in the amateur boxing realm, had their stories. And so you're you're going back in and kind of asking people to talk about a very fraught and you know and also really amazing time for them. And you could say never mind and just read the longo piece, but if you got anything. No, I mean that was a really wonderful part of this whole process was that um, everyone that I reached out and I had a friend who was helping me to make connections, you know, finding their numbers or where they were. Um, they were without hesitation, just absolutely. I would love to see you. I would love to talk with you. Um, and they were very frank and, um, in the book, there are some that, you know, their voices when I, um, I introduce all of them, but they come back during the story and um, they're from interviews or from transcripts of interviews. So I use their voices and also wrote some of the scenes that they described. They were all like this Huguenot Boxing Club was the name of what the name. gym. Yeah. Well, it was because, well, we don't need to get into that, but <laughs> you know, the colonialists in my hometown, but anyway. It's a little loaded. Yeah, it's a little fraught. Um, but they, it, it was so huge to them, like the time, the many years that they'd spent there. And um, they, it was just a huge, huge part of their lives. Um, and because I came back to it in 2021, I had to like 
call him up and say, hey, you yeah. remember me? I was talking about writing this book, you know, and none of them were like, oh my gosh, you know, they were just so yay. And I, there's one person that I'm going to read a little bit about him. He calls me every couple of weeks. Is it out? Is it out? <laughs> you know, and so. I'm going to fall through, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, got a Christmas text from one of the other fighters who's in his um, 70s and really bad health, but just, you know, just reaching out. And um, the one person that I was nervous about was talking with Floyd. And I did try. I called and wrote to both he and his um, wife, whose name is Janet. Um, and uh, he was not in a place. He, he had Alzheimer's. He had prostate cancer. He was just not in a place that he could talk. But I was able to talk with his adopted son. So, Nice. Do you want to read the piece about your interactions with Longo? Sure. Longo is, um, he is a real character and he is, you get to know his, the way he talks throughout the uh, book. He pops back in every once in a while. Um, so I went to Jacksonville, Florida to interview him. Um, Longo. It's a small apartment. It suits Longo. He still looks like a leprechaun, a much older Florida variety leprechaun. I haven't seen him in at least 15 years. And as he lets me in the door, I give him a hug, though it isn't as if we were ever close. We sit at his kitchen table, which takes half of the space and can only seat two people. I'm a bit nervous, though Longo has been nothing but enthusiastic from the day I first called him at his shoe repair shop on the east coast of Florida. I remember seeing Longo fight only once. He'd entered the rings wearing trunks, a t-shirt, and a pair of rust and green argyle socks sagging on one ankle. He'd won his fight handily, but in the following years, I mostly knew him as an assistant trainer manager of sorts at the Huguenot Boxing Club. As I fiddle with my tape recorder, this was 2003, <laughs> I, glance up, I glance up to find him watching my every movement like a bright-eyed bird. He's at least 55 and his face seems to have spread a bit as if to make room for the years. Hair's still brown and curly, but thin towards the back. His scrub of beard and mustache is mostly gray. No longer wiry, Longo is now just small and thick, though still in shape, and wearing a pair of sweatpants and a jacket with a t-shirt underneath. Just as I turn on the tape, tape recorder, he says, wait a minute. He leans back and crumples a beer can in one hand while opening the refrigerator with the other to take out another. It's a practice movement and the empty is discarded somewhere, just gone when he swivels back and settles in to tell stories about the boxing club, Floyd and Brian. Longo is a first rate Rankin tour and it's not just the beer talking. He falls quiet when I stop him to load another tape into the recorder. He suddenly asks, what's your mom think about all of this? I haven't told her. I need to write it all out and then show her. Well, he says, look at it this way. She's already lived through Brian dying. There ain't nothing that'll be more painful than that. You're probably right, I say. I can tell that he isn't satisfied with the word probably, and neither am I. I got to call you out. 2003, you still tape recorder, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's ask questions. Let the audience ask questions, one from you guys, and then we'll field one from zoom and back again and um i'll try to repeat the questions just because somebody may not hear in one of these zones that we're in anybody want to ask a question to janet no, 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 with, uh, can you give a sense of what a fight was like can you he, um can you hey jeff can you give a sense of what one of his fights was like uh one of brian's fights yeah. um well the fights for me at that time, it was 
very exciting. Of course, I never, I always believed that, of course, he would win, right? Because that's what you do. And that he would never be hurt by any of the blows that would hit him. But his blows would really hurt that other person and he would win, right? So I was always very excited. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I write quite a few scenes of fight, fight scenes in here, different people who are fight, you know, different fights that I went to. And um, I, I don't know how, what, what else I can tell you about it that you won't be able to read me. But... <laughs> no, I mean, there are details that are very, um, you know, the weird thing about a lot of those amateur fights is that they were like in these small spaces with people smoking, with uh, people who were totally dressed up like they were going to a club or, you know, my mom would go and she would wear just, you know, sneakers or whatever. Um, and, and it was just such a mix. It was just such a diverse mix of folks who would come to the fights. And because we were with Brian and Brian was with Floyd, we got a lot of attention for that. And Floyd got a lot of attention, of course, in those places. Stephanie, do you want to help facilitate a Zoom question? So the first question starts with the compliment, which was, I loved this book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just asking if you will write more. Oh. Oh. Will you write more? <laughs> yes, I will write more. I honestly, I'm not sure exactly what my next big project is. I'm doing some freelance article writing um, right now, but I think another, another big project's around the corner, but I don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I saw another hand up here at the first time. Anybody still want to ask that question? Yeah. It's just about your writing process. I'm, I'm curious what it is to drop a project like that for 10 years. And obviously a lot of growing and maturing and life circumstances happens in that 10 years. And you go back and you read what you wrote 10 years ago. Did you edit? Or did you leave well, it? Well, I'm supposed to. The question was, oh, right. what was your writing okay. process? What was it like dropping a book for 10 years? And my mind just went somewhere else so for a second. I, I guess I'd be curious your perspective changing after 10 years of living and going back and reading what you wrote. Yeah. And if you felt obligated to leave it as it was, or did you change it given a newer perspective maybe? Um, that's a great question. Could you and kind of re rephrase it? Rephrase it for the folks. To, yeah. Right, okay. Sorry. Annoying. So the question is whether or not after, or, or after coming back to this manuscript, after 10 years, did I just work with the material I had already written or did I have new perspective and go back in and edit? Um, and the answer to that is that there was a lot of material that pretty much stayed very much the way that it had started, although it might have shifted in place in the structure. But there were definitely lots of new, um, my new awarenesses, my new thoughts about certain things. And in fact, I actually, that was when I went back and interviewed um, Tracy Patterson, Floyd's son, adopted son, um, because I just, there was something that felt undone and I just needed to go and, and talk with him. So yeah, it was a, a mix of both those things, yeah. You took the idea of putting it in a drawer a little too seriously, you know, put it in a drawer for a while and come back to it and you just <laughs> forgot about it. You know, just, <laughs> what drawer? Yeah. Right. Usually writers say it's under the bed, right? So it wasn't, but yeah, it was right there on my laptop. Do you, Stephanie, do you want to do another Zoom? We don't have another one from home, so okay. we can move through the answer. Hey, Britt, yep. How has your family responded to this book and what it's, and have they read it and what has 
their impression been and what was your what were your considerations in writing this for the rest of your family? Um, so the question was, um, what was my family's response to the book and um, have they read it? What were their thoughts? Um, so my family at this point, um, my immediate family, who's two, two are here, my husband and my daughter, they have read it. And of course, they tell me they love it, <laughs> which um, I'm so grateful for. <laughs> and um, my mom passed at the beginning, right before the pandemic, which honestly was a, a freedom for me. Um, and she was very much of the old guard. She just felt like you do not talk about family secrets. That was a big part of when we were living in New Paltz was we weren't supposed to tell anybody what was happening with my brother. Although of course in a small town, everybody knew what was happening. Um, so I never really, I didn't go back. That piece with Longo says that I would show it to her after I wrote the whole thing, but um, it was, you know, in the end, I just made a choice that I wasn't going to do that. So um, I have a younger sister who's in Asheville and um, she has read it, but we have not yet gotten together. She's sick tonight, was not able to come. And uh, so I will find out more uh, when, she, when she comes. I will say that the folks who did talk with me, I sent them all their pages. <laughs> Yeah. so that they could read and make sure that it felt good, you know, felt like it was true to them, what they said. That makes sense. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I, I just want to follow up on the, the same question about the family, but in your writing process, like, was that in your head all the time? <laughs> so, so you're writing about this very personal history and you know that the family is there. I mean, it, it's sort of a, a type of that I think writers have to navigate. And so, how did that work? <laughs> um, so, the question was about navigating that tightrope of when you are writing about family and there are family stories, and if it stays in your mind, like, is that right? Yeah, like, so, uh, should I be? Writing, not, not only your obligation to show it to them, but, or, or not, but just whether they're in their, in your head. Also, in yeah, that, that's actually a good question. Um, in terms of writing pieces with my dad or my mom, things that were going on, like I, a lot of those experiences had been analyzed by sisters, you know, talked about, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, I did find that I had so much more compassion now for choices that they were making and where they, how they dealt with things. And so I, yeah, it was always in my head and those, that analysis that we would do, like I tried to put that to the side so I could enter into it in a new more open place, I guess. Yes, please. So I have two questions. First of all, congratulations. Thank mm -hmm. you, Kimmy. Um, one is, what's the role of, like, how does the fangirl piece kind of, you know, play out here? <laughs> so fangirl, how does that play out? Fangirl, how does that play out? Um, well, at the time, when so I was in middle school and um, I was I was all team Brian, you know, I was just like going to the fights, talking to the but talking to my friends in middle school, you know, trying to get them to what was the age difference? Sorry to interrupt. Four years. Four years, okay. You know, recruiting fans to the fan club, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And like I said, I read Ring magazine. I just I, I just, yeah, so that fangirl thing was uh, wonderful. 
And then, of course, as things started to slide with my brother and his depression and mental health issues, and, and then I, as, as happens, my anger about all of that was really started to replace the fangirl, you know? So, um, but writing it, I felt like I was still a fan. Mm -hmm. Somehow I knew you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> and so my next question is, I haven't read the book yet, I will, but I have this feeling, this sense that, you know, this could be like another way of honoring, addressing, kind of unpacking um, addiction and mm -hmm. mental wellness and mental health. And so where do you see Brian's place, your place, you know, the collective place <clears throat> in that work? I don't want to get the way, could you just... <laughs> <laughs> I have a role to play, so we need to make sure that people hear the question, so... <laughs> The question is about. Um, a good question. Sorry. It was a good question, a meaty question. Um, it was about addiction and how I see my role. Is that right? Yeah, and Brian's role. And Brian's role. Yeah. yeah. So having. Uh, Having written this, one of the things that um, I remember, my brother went into numerous rehabs, um, so many, I, I can't even remember how many, um, but I know that often he would go into these rehabs, like not really believing it was gonna help. And um, I think that in telling his story, um, it really points out still how relevant um, the idea of, of addiction and people's understanding of addiction and what people need in terms of addiction um, is still, still growing and not really there. Like he would go for a month, let's just fix him. Let's get him all fixed up. And then he would come home, right? And that's really not how that works. Um, and so I think that my role, I'm, I'm actually going to be doing a reading in Winston-Salem at a new, um, a new recovery program. It's new to Winston-Salem. It's actually very... Uh, it's been in Durham for probably 17 or 18 years. It's called TROSA and it's a two year residential program. And all I can, and so I was asked if I would do a reading there. Um, and I think that that's something that I would like to spend some time doing um, just because it, it, I have thought ever since I learned about this program that if Brian could have done that, if he could have gone and been there for several years. Um, and still, you know, I mean, there are folks who leave Trosa who, who still are struggling and kind of fall back. But, um, and also in terms of my own, you know, I made a choice after Brian died that I needed to deal with my own substance abuse and um, just, you know, being able to be open with folks about that too. Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> it's, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's, it is now and it'll probably evolve. Yeah. Thank you. We have some, oh, we have, sorry, hold on one second. We'll do one from Zoom, then we'll do you, and then we might be coming to the end. So I have like three more questions. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, question from Bob at home. Um, Brian, now that you've completed the book, how are you feeling? Relieved to have it finished? 
sorry that it's suddenly over. Uh, thinking of another project. I'm sure some combination thereof is what. Yeah. So how are you feeling now that the book is done? So how are you feeling? Just now that the book's done, there's A, there's B, there's door number one, there's door number two, <laughs> there's relief, there's despair, and there's really naive elation. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, relief. I am, I am relieved that this is actually um, real. Like there's a real book. Right. <laughs> and so that is a big relief. And um, I don't think that you ever really leave a, a book project that it lives on in you. So um, I don't have a new project in mind. And I, I had to get this done before a new one would have any sort of space to, to appear. A quick thought, and we'll jump to you. Is we talked a couple of days ago trying to get ready for this. And, and she's like, yeah, the book hasn't, you know, the book, Malaprops has the book I saw in the window. How cool. And I'm like, so you got your copy? She's like, no, it's, it's coming, it's coming. I'm like, excuse me? Go to Malaprops and get a copy of the book. It was so restrained. It was like, I can't believe it. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I was, I've not read the final version, but I read what I assume is close to a final very version. Close. Mm -hmm. um, and when I read it, I was very, uh, very struck by just how well you were able to recall uh, a lot of aspects of your youth and of those um, interactions from that time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, what pieces of the story did you find easy to recall details and aspects of, and which parts of the story were really challenging to, to recall for whatever reason. Hmm. I don't know if I could pinpoint now, which were, hmm. So I, I went back and I read through, uh, I was always a journal keeper even as a younger kid. So I read journals. I read letters from my mom when I was at college. I read um, an interesting thing. One of his friends gave me a bunch of Brian's writing. That's the other thing about this is yeah. Brian's writing he's is all through it. throughout this book. He's a good writer. He's interesting. Yeah, he's a good writer. And so... I read through the writing that he had. Um, I read uh, books about, you know, boxing, about um, addiction, all of that. Um, and I think in terms of those, the things that were easier were maybe those pieces from when I was a child, because the, they get told, their family stories that get told over and over and over again, right? And um, yeah, and then with the interviews too, and some of the letters, like, and I say this in the book at one point, like, I always said to people that my mother never apologized. And then I'm like reading these letters from college. I, I have a really hard time getting mm -hmm. rid of letters. Um, and, I'm, and she's like, I really want to say I'm sorry. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> she says she's sorry. Like there were just, and like, I, I, I was it's like, wow, I have to revise, I have to revise. And um, so that helped me to kind of look back on things, maybe and access a little bit more perspective, at least on certain things. Nice. Yeah. Stephanie, do we have time for a couple more? Or where are we at? Um, we do. We, we got started a little bit late, so and it's not yet seven. So okay. If I got a question, but I want to. I'm going to ask it only if there's not other questions. Yeah. Go for it, please. Um, and yeah. So to, a memoir sounds like it was an incredibly cathartic experience for you. As you look back and read it now, did you expect that it would have all the connotations of mental health and addiction in it? Was it your personal process for you seeing the other side, the perception of the readers? Did you expect some of that? 
Um, I did really. I I think that. Did you repeat the question? I don't think oh. pe people could hear it on Zoom. I'm so sorry. It's yeah. okay. Um, did um, the question was. I don't know if I can say it as beautifully as I'm ruining the moment. <laughs> but um let's go ahead and answer it. Never mind. <laughs> That's even more the process is cathartic for you. Did you anticipate the me getting uh -huh. into the mental health? Yeah. yeah. Um thank you, Kimmy. <laughs> um I did because the narrative of my brother's life and my family and people who know him in my small town, it was always, what a shame, right? And, um, and like, what happened to him? What, how did this happen? You know, he was this brilliant guy. And then, and so, so that was always the narrative. And so, um, be, going back to that idea of love shy, um, wanting to like step towards that and not, and not be afraid to really bring that in. And for myself too, I felt really clear that if I was going to be bringing in, if I was going to talk about all of Brian's challenges that I needed to bring in my own struggles, that just it felt ethical and in solidarity with him. Yeah, you can't be club shy either. Yeah, I can't be club shy. Yeah. Hi, Marie. <laughs> um, it sounds like as somebody who's gonna be very fresh when I read the book, um, there's a lot to uncover or a lot to learn from our uh, addiction, mental health, boxing, which I appreciate that. What is the one thing you'd love for, or you hope people get out of it? I can do this. What is the one thing <laughs> that you hope people can get out of it? Okay. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. That's a large question. Um, I I think that. As the adult I am now, I hope that what people get out of it is that stepping forward and like being able to step into what's happening, what's really happening and talk about things. And, um, and that there's so much humanity and love in that. Yeah. I've got to stop there. I mean, 